So after the loan spell with Stoke, did Tony Pulis come in and try to sign you full time then? Is that how that moved uh, you After the loan spell, I went back and then, yeah, we tried to raise something like to, to sort it to go back there. Mm-hmm. I suppose you didn't need too much convincing to join Tony Pulis and Stoke. No, I loved it. I loved Stoke. Um, great time. Um, yeah, the, the love I got from the fans there. Uh, yeah, I was like, I'll go there. The players that were there were good. Um, Tony Pulis was, was good with me. Um, just very straight down the line. Um, his style was not was very different than I was ever used to. But for me, just defend. It got into nothing different. Just defend. Part of that, we had like a like a robust robust back four. We were like, you know, Wayne Thomas, me, uh, Jerry Taggart, uh, maybe there's sometimes John Halls. Uh, yeah, we had like a a, a, a meaty back four at times. Mm. I think it shows how much he rated you. Every appearance is a start you had for Stoke. He didn't make one appearance on the bench. So no. he must have really rated you. And it's funny, like football's a game of opinions, how you can then sort of be at the wrong end of, of one manager's thoughts and then straight at the high end of another manager's thoughts. How did you get on with Tony Pulis and what did you think of him as a manager? I got fine with him. Um, yeah, like, again, like his, his management was very, like, direct. We didn't used to do many five asides. Um, it was mainly like tactics where you played. That was his way. It was brought his success. Um, the club was like great. Um, the people were great. Uh, then he left. Uh, and then when he come back, we had a. a uh, when he come back, I was captain at the time. I was made captain by Joran Boschkamp, and then totally come back. And he sold me, and you know, before he he, he sold me, he did say to me. You know what? So I'll be honest with you, dude. You're one of the best signings I've made at this club. So that, that you know, so that was a, a a nice thing for him. So he didn't have to say that. Didn't offer me to say that. So um, yeah, I found him found him okay. His style of football was different. His training was different, and especially when he come back from, we had Joran Bosch camp. We was Dutch, and we just played football, five side football, keep ball, football, 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 and then Tony come, and then it was like change the style again. Um, but yeah, it was fine. It was alright. You know, I know that everyone's cup of tea. You know, he's walked training ground. He has two balls under his arms. Come and do this set, please. Set, please. Do this bit. Look, we'll go to the next bit. We didn't do very many five sides, but um, that was that. It was fine. You're certainly good at defending corners under him, anyway. That's for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it's a, it was like a big team when we went up to the corners. Like, oh my god, we had six footers like. At least eight in the team. He didn't have had eight six footers in the team, loads. Mm. Interesting. How did you find Stoke? Because you've been in you've been in London, you've been in Leeds, you're then in Stoke. Was there a big difference in sort of nightlife and uh, sort of uh, shopping and things? Uh, yeah, shopping was like, you know, the Stoke Town Centre Hanley wasn't like many it was, you're like your little high street shops. Um but if you wanted something different, you have to go to Manchester or Birmingham. Yeah. But like, nightlife um, was great. Um, at the time, it was me, Gifton, Noel Williams, John Halls, uh, Peter Sweeney. Like, I had my London contingent yeah. with me, like, like very close. Um, so yeah, it was like we'd go out like a Tuesday night. It was it was this and it was wicked. Like, like <laughs> it's totally was wicked. It's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'd now like to come on to Reading. Quite interesting in itself. You've got a clause in your contract that enables you to speak to Premier League clubs. Obviously, uh, everyone wants to aspire to get back into the Premier League. Big chance for you in the shape of Reading. Can you talk to me about that and how it came to fruition? Um, it was a chance as well to get back near a home. Um, so, you know, I'm playing in Premier League. It's where you want to be. Um, so yeah, I, I, I jumped at the chance um, to get back, uh, and you know, would Reading be like my first pick? It didn't matter. Like it was, it was close enough to home, a drive I can do, and I'm playing Premier League football. So uh, yeah, so it was just up for me. Let's get back there. 
Who was in the Reading team when you signed? What players stand out for and you? Sonko. Oh, who stood out? I mean, the defenders of Sonko and uh, Ivor. What stood out? Who stood out? Strike Force. Uh, Leroy Lee. Lea. Yes. Um, that Dave Kitson, Ola, Kevin Doll, goal scorer. Uh, in midfield, you had James Harper, baller, Steve Sidwell, player. Um, Nicky Shorey was the one I didn't know much about. I thought, oh, what a nice player he was, man. Like, nice, tidy left foot. Left back. Like, yeah, he got an England call up as well. Um, he was tidy. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a nice team. It was very close knit. So when you come in, you had to really break that. Mm. You know what I mean? They built something at the time and very close knit. And so when you come in, it's like you have to, you have to really um, break that. And I think sometimes players come in and that's why they don't do well because they can't break into that um, that closeness of the team. But I liked it. Steve Koppel was brilliant. Um, quiet man. Didn't shout. Well, very thoughtful. Um, I love when he spoke. Um, always had something meaningful to to say. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I did. I did like my time there. I did, I did like Steve Coppel as well. We had the privilege of having Leroy Lita on the channel. He spoke very highly of his time at Reading and Steve Coppel and Ibrahim Asonko and the the kind of bond that you guys had as a team, which I think is, is underestimated at times. It was, it, was, it was, I told you, it was very close to it. I think they built Stanley Cup over the last, the, the previous couple of years to eventually, like, accumulate to that, you know, record-breaking promotion. Yeah. Now they're in the Premier League and um, they're doing what they're doing. So, it, it's, 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 it's built, it was built over a good two, two seasons, two, three seasons, you know, and little by little, Steve Cup will build on that. But yeah, it come you know when they got to Premier League, it was really, it was really, um, you saw the peak of it. But I actually, when I give my talks to um, people and teams, and I actually use uh, my Reading team as, as an example of when you have a team that has uh, one single focus and drive, and everyone aspire in the same direction compared to a team that everyone wants something different and personal aspirations. So the first season in the Premier League, when everyone had that single drive, you know, to be in a league, to show that we're a good team, everyone looking for the same thing, everyone wanted to do well as a collective, compared to after that first season success and the next season, when it become a little bit individual, like everyone, you know, believed that there was that bit better, to believe that you know they could compete like they want to show what they can do individually and the 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 focus becomes different so instead of everyone looking that way there's like all different things and the strength of reading was the team do you know what i mean the strength of reading was the team and all of a sudden now everyone wants to be individuals and and it's very hard as, as, as a player sometimes you have not an ego but you have this belief that hey we're good so when you're playing at liverpool and you're having to be as a team, you know, on be passive to them. Sometimes, if you're not careful, it messes with your head and thinking, "Oh, better than that, we want to be something different." But you have to understand that that's a better team. Like you have to be real with yourself and say it's a better team. And sometimes, when to come away from that, you want to show individually how good I am. But then you come away from the team thing. And I always use Reading as an example of like when people stick to team and understand that the the strength is in the team compared to the individual thinking he can be the collective on his own. And what comes away from that, what made him good is being part of a good team. You know, and the second season where it went downhill and, you know, in 12 months where there's not much change, the only thing that changed was the mindset and the mentality of the team where got to maybe eighth in that season and then got to relegated the next season. So... It's a, it's a massive thing that how everyone come away and everyone believed maybe it's a good players but believe come away from the what made them good and what made the team good which what brought them success. When the team does well, you bring success. You do well, doesn't bring the, necessarily bring that. I mean, it's it's individual. So 
And that was a difference. Is it a difficult thing to deal with going to big clubs when you've been at a big club before? So when you're visiting the likes of Liverpool and Manchester United and you're with Chelsea or Leeds, so you've got a good chance of, of maybe coming away with something. Do you have to change your mentality and mindset when you're a smaller club going to a bigger team or do you have to be more on it? What, how does that, that process work? One, I think you just realise where you're at and then you realise you know, what you're dealing with. And, you know, going to Man United with, with Reading, um, you, you know you're going to be up against it, but you're going to be up against it if you're Chelsea. It's just that maybe you have, you have a chance to impose yourself a little bit more. Uh, so... When you go there, your your mindset changes. You have to be on it because, you know, you you can't you can't make a mistake. You know, you get punished, but you have to try and give few chances. You have to concentrate more, close the gap. So you are, you know, as a collective, they're much better. And even as individuals, you have to think, oh, actually, they're they're better. Hence, why they're playing at Man United and we're playing at Reading because individually, they're they're going to be usually better. Um, so you just have to change your approach and your mindset and think, okay. What am I against? I'm up against a Ronaldo. I'm up against a Rooney. Okay, here, now's a chance for me to show why I should be, but maybe be in that sort of sense of class and that um, way of being. So, yeah, it, it's, you have to change it. If you change, don't change your mindset, you'll struggle. You definitely have to be a little bit um, different in your approach. After the relegation suffered by Reading, um, for whatever reason, you've chose to... to maybe move on and not, not re-sign at Reading. Is that right? Were you offered a, a new deal at Reading? Can you explain to me the intricacies behind that? I was, I was going to go with your version. <laughs> no. Um, now, what happened was, uh, so, with the season coming, they wasn't doing any sort of contracts until and a few people out of contract. And I think they were waiting to see um, where we were in the league. Um, so in the end of the season we got relegated uh, Nicky Hammond called me and said we're, not, we're going a different direction which is fair enough but um, would that I be do... the wage bill down as well do you feel to get the wage bill down where they're dropping out of the Premier League I, I just feel that um, there's a lot of senior players I think there's a few senior players they got rid of um, I just think the direction they wanted to go um, uh, maybe the wage bill as well but just uh just in the direction they wanted to, 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 to take. Um, so, yeah, they didn't offer me um, uh, a new deal, which is a bit um, gutted because I did like the place. Um, but, again, it's football and I've got no problems with opinions. And um, we can sit here and say, yeah, I think I should have got a new deal. But the person whose opinion mattered didn't. So, uh, yeah, so we didn't, didn't uh, get an extension that one. This takes us on to your next career journey of Wickham Wanderers. Initially, yeah. away joining the club, appointed club captain as well, which must be fantastic for yourself as, as coming in as a senior player to have that respect immediately. Talk to me yeah. about your time at Wickham. Uh, I went there. I remember having a, a chat with Charlton before, after Wickham, but it's too far from where I was, like Hertfordshire, to go over like New Eltham every day, over the bridge or whatever. I'm like, out of kill me. I'm a team so early there and back like four hours. Um, and uh, I remember speaking to um, Peter Taylor, who's my under-21 coach. And I thought, oh, I'd love to work with Peter Taylor again. Um, so I thought, yeah, I'm definitely doing that. Um, just what he wanted to do. So I thought, yeah, come there. He made me uh, team captain. Um, I, I loved it. I thought, yeah, I want to be part of something, like getting up going up um, and I like you know, we had a, a good squad there um, had a young Matty Phillips was there um, so that was good we had a lot of good team but um, unfortunately Peter didn't last too long when I was there uh, and um, it kind of changed things because uh, Gary Waddock took over and uh, that didn't work out too well for me did you and him get on instantly then or something? You know what the crazy thing is, right? When uh, Gary would have come in and he said, um, come in, they're doing, doing, you're right. Gaffrey goes, listen, he asked me like, you know, how's things? I said like, we've got such a good squad. We just need like a push and direction and just maybe it'll kick up the arse. Cool. Listen, um, 
I'm going to rely on you to help me with this. Like, no problem, like, do you know what I mean? Because I want to succeed, like, I want to succeed. So he's doing that training, you know, backed him up with his words. And I remember, uh, I can't remember the, the assistant's name, um, but he was like, he's, I think he's at Reading now, but he was like this midfielder, he's, he's like just aggressive. Um, and uh, we played a game, we, we, we played a game at uh, Huddersfield. Yeah, we played Huddersfield. Huddersfield? Yeah, played Huddersfield. And I'll never forget, so I remember a couple of boys were, were, were was like, it was on a Sunday, changed the TV games. It was on a Saturday, and I planned to go to Glasgow for a weekend with the boys, and then our game got put on a Sunday. I was like devastated, so I couldn't go to Glasgow. Um, so I remember playing, and um, it was on TV, and we got, we got pumped like 6 1, like awful. And all the time thinking, they must be in Glasgow bar laughing and watching this while getting the demon. I was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking that, right? So, we got pumped six, six, or six, one or something like that. So, it's just awful. So, coming in the change room, and uh, I'll never forget this, and then the assistant, his name was Cooley or something, I can't remember his name, what right guy, and he's going, he's like, all pacing up and down. Something like that. And then, uh, Gary Wallace going into this, you lot should be embarrassed. That was embarrassing. Embarrassing. You know what? I don't care. And he started getting to talk. I don't care who you are, where you've been, who you've played for, whether it's Champions League, Premier League. I don't care how much you earn. So why are you saying all this? Like, I swear to God. Why are you saying all this? Everyone's like thinking, ain't me, ain't me. So all, all eyes are like looking at me. Like, you can feel it all the eyes looking at me, like, okay, where you been, who you are, what your status is here. You're not safe. You're not safe. I'm not like, sitting there thinking, is he talking about me? But everything, like, no one has played, no one has played Premier League or nothing like that, right? So I'm sitting there, Champions League, so I'm sitting there thinking, wow. Oh. So then, then the, 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 the sister's going, fuck it, guys. Fuck it. I'll fight him. I let me have, I'll fight him. No, no, leave it. I'm thinking, fight him. Like, I'm, I'm sitting there, like, been in football a while, like fight who? What are you gonna fight? You're gonna fight. Surely we're, we're we're not at that stage of this is not prehistoric days. It's all about fighting. So I'm sitting here like going, are they see is he serious? And you know what? Forget talking to you, just go and get showered. So I'm sitting there like thinking, obviously my professional pride's dented, personal pride's dented. So like we've got Pat six one on TV. So training comes now, doing training and um uh, I think we had a game at Millwall in the week, doing training, doesn't do team shape or nothing. Go to Millwall, the new den. I'm on the bench, I'm not even playing. I'm on the bench. I'm like, raw. Like, I'm not even like being stripped. I'm saying, I'm not playing for Wickham. Like, I was like, like, come on now. Like, this is, this is, this is a right. But I don't kick up a fast, it's a game, not going to say gaffer, just support the boys. So I'll go like try and see him the next day. Um, uh, he makes up some, some. Uh, what did he say? He makes up something about yeah, you're too good for the league. Too good, like well, people see me on the bench don't think that, do they? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So he didn't say nothing. And I remember that time. So again, he started doing that thing where. I wasn't involved in squads. He had me train on a Saturday, running with youth team players. Um, it's gone from team captain to this. Um, and then uh, he, um, remember one time there was a, there was a young lad. Remember, he's at, where's he now? I think he's at Cardiff, Kadeem Harris. Young lad, talented player. And I was trying to help him, help him. He's like, shut up, I'm fucking talking to you. You're not my dad. So I'm like, who are you talking to? Like, I'm trying to help you. And I remember every player, like senior player, ever, like just didn't say nothing. The staff didn't say nothing. I'm thinking, well, you're gonna let a young lad talk to a senior player like that? Okay, cool. So I saw how the club was moving, see how he was moving, and uh, so it went on a little bit. Like the whole, I remember training with the training with the youth team, like the the again youth team players like that, and then not saying anything, and then 
the youth team manager at the time, who was a little weasel, I can't remember his name. We didn't say nothing. It was like, okay, cool. So then, uh, I thought, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say nothing then because they're just gonna try and get me to buy it, to fire me, take wages away, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I remember that happened, and Wrighty, Ian Wright was doing a thing like uh, a football show where he got this player from prison and was trying to get him into football, and he took this player down to Wickham, and he's speaking to the the chairman at the time, and then he said, "Oh." Dude, see, how's Dude getting on in terms of not playing? What do you mean? Blah, blah. I remember Wrighty phoned me that night. He goes, Dude, what's going on? Ah, oh, blah, blah. It's the Wrighty. They're trying to get me by it. I said, no, fuck that. Like, dudes, just go in there and tell them to make you leave. Like, like have these people, like, try to embarrass you. You're established player. Have these trying to embarrass you, like, trying to have you up, like, like, you're not playing. Like, just go and tell them. It made me think, like, actually, you know what? Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like, having him have me out, like, just trying to, put me out here and I should be playing here. So I remember again, the next day I went to see the manager. Can I see you? Can I see my training? Okay, no worries. So I went knocking on his door. He goes, oh, I'll wait here, dude, just sell a couple of balls. I'll be 10 minutes, 20 minutes later, half hour later, 40 minutes later, I'm still sitting outside his office. I think he's thinking I'm gonna, gonna leave because he comes out and he's got his bag and stuff. Oh, tubes, I, sorry, I forgot. I'm coming. So I'm like, Gaffer, what's going on? What do you mean? If you don't want me, just let me go. No, 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 dude, I said to you before. Like, you know, I said, listen, like my phone's here. I'm not recorded nothing. Let's be honest, man to man. Come on now. If you don't like me, just let me go. But don't sit me here like, and treat me like a son. So like, come on now. You don't even, you go, no, no, no. No, what is no... Uh, like just pleading, like talking rubbish. I said, oh, just let me go then. Here's, here's, a, here's a, the, the chairman's number. Here's the chairman's number. Like, speak to the chairman. Like, um, like yeah, like, here. Go out. Took the chairman's number. I spoke to the chairman um, that evening. Uh, what's his name again? Steve? Steve, someone, I can't remember. Um, and spoke to the chairman that evening. And by the next, next day, lunchtime, I'd sorted out a deal and left the club. And then uh, that was that. But again, like, you know, and if I'm honest, I don't even sit here like comfortable like, like hammering, like, um, hammer, not hammer, like, hammering anyone. I've just told the story, the truth. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure some might say, oh, yeah, it was disruptive. Do you know, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, I think most people were like, you know, like the, the, the Gary Waddock, the Kevin Black was intimidated. I know how to, like, if I wanted to be imposing of, as, as a six foot one person and a big personality, I could be. And not saying I could influence anyone, but I had a, an influence on change room. I remember um, a manager, uh, a coach, uh, ready to say to me, just be careful because when you're like, oh, when a manager talks, people are looking at you for validation if you're talking real because you've been around. So I know how my influence can be used. And I never use my influence to go against anyone. Um, if I thought something, I try to hide it the best I could if it was negative. If I didn't agree with something, I try and be polite. But it's like, you know, them managers there, like, you know, to like, and that's what I'm saying. I'm a senior player. Like, he was a senior player once. I don't know if Kevin Black was. I don't know if he used to play football anyway. But they know how, how you'd want to be treated. So you can all, all obviously he said to me, do the, the situation, but get so in touch with this whole politics some and speaker and blah 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 but yeah it wasn't you know when he come um again another person if i see him like um i wouldn't bad him up or like try and be aggressive him but if he's got into a conversation you know when you get the conversation he's gonna say yeah i was right i was you're right i did treat you wrong he knew he treat me wrong back then anyway and then kevin blackwell so but they're not on my radar anyway. we've got nothing to speak about if i if i saw them now we had nothing, we had nothing to speak about um, so I, I wouldn't even engage in a conversation with them. Not in bad minding, because we're so far from that world and that, but, you know, we've got nothing to speak about. Am I badding him up or trying to bad mouth him? No, he just dealt with the situation wrong and um, not my cup of tea. Four days after you parted company with Wickham Wanderers, you joined St Johnston up in Scotland. First time of playing your trade outside of England as well. 
quite interesting. Yeah. I know you're a big fan of nights out in Glasgow. What was St Johnston like? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. St Johnston was brilliant. I keep saying that, but it was like, um, I remember when I drove up, I, I drove up there and uh, I had my little, uh, I thought I'm going to take my little um, Mercedes up there. I had a Mercedes uh, little C class coupe. And, um, but I, I, I was driving up there and I must have got to uh, Carlisle. And I swear my sat nav must have busted. So I was just driving on looking at road signs. So I remember I was going to Jody's like, and I was like, ah, oh, bruv, like, I couldn't, it was late night in it, so I didn't want to phone him too late to wake him up. And luckily I found it, but it was like two hours over the, I must have drove all the way nearly up to St. Johnson before I come back, really I've got so far. It was a nightmare. Um, so then I drove to the next day, um, Derek McInnes, the manager, like it was, it, was, it was wicked. I went there thinking, I want to play at Celtic and Rangers before I retire. So it was like part of my reason. Play out there, chance to play with Jody again, we're good friends. Um, Is that Jody Morris? Yeah. Um, we come through like virtually Chelsea ranks together. We, we come and joined at Leeds. Um, so we, we, yeah, we were good friends at the time. Um, so yeah, it was a chance to just play against some of the clubs you've seen, the Aberdeens, the Celtic, the Rangers, the Hearts, the Ibernians. Um, I just loved it. Like, yeah. Um, it was it was it was good. Like we, I, I lived in Glasgow, and then and then drove up to um, Perth. It was, it was a, we had a car school, so I was driving one every uh, say four days. But sometimes when you was passing, it was all scratched up at the back. Like, uh, so that like, time was alright. And then plus you get to choose the music. So yeah, it was alright. I, I did love St Johnston. What was the experience of like playing against Celtic and Rangers? I know it's not the same as being involved in an old firm derby, so to speak, but to have that experience as a player, did you relish that? Yeah, to play in the stadiums, to play against Rangers and massive clubs, Celtic and massive club. You know, you're, you're the underdog. You know, I've got a 4-1 victory under my belt playing for St. Johnson against Rangers. You know, a massive victory. You know, that don't happen too often. Um, it was just like um, good to be up there and playing, um, to be felt, to be loved, to be wanted, to be valued. Um, yeah, but them stadiums going up there was a uh, yeah, it was uh, enjoyable and like again, good memories and something I can take away with me. You must have enjoyed it that much because after your initial stay, you extended your stay and re-signed again for another year, which. Which obviously yeah. you know, you're settled, you're enjoying your football, you're enjoying the Scottish way of life. It's fantastic. Yes, I mean, Dell was very good to me. He said, you know, he let me go home. Um, so I was up there on my own. He let me go home uh, regularly. Um, sometimes I have like two days off and then come back just to keep me happy. So I was homesick. When I was up there one one time, it, it was snowing really bad. I didn't get home for like six, six to eight weeks. I was like, oh, I was trapped in my flat in Glasgow, um, but it, it was it was it was it was good. I did love it up there, and the football was good, and the fans were good. Um, St. Everyone always asks, "What's your team, Rangers or Celtic?" And I say, "St. Johnson, all the time. St. Johnson, all the time." Fair play. This brings us on to our next journey for yourself in in the shape of Oxford United. What yeah. Can you tell me about your time at, at Oxford United. Um. How did I come back? I mean, I think I got my agent found about Oxford and I remember going down there and speaking to Chris Wilder. Um, I spoke to um, Andy Melville first and Andy Melville knew my agent. He was his agent. And he said, oh, then Chris Wilder was speaking to him down at uh, the stadium, telling me his plans. I see in the stadium thinking, you've got a stand missing. You've only got three stands. What's going on there? Um, so, uh, um, speaking to him and I think initially they just wanted to do a one year deal I'm not, I'm not signing a one year deal it's like two years or nothing um, and they agreed and then uh, yeah it was a it was a good time at Oxford like real good time real good time good club nice club friendly club good fans um, yeah I really enjoyed myself first career hat trick for Oxford as well and oh, I pulled out I pulled out <laughs> Left uh, foot, right foot header. 
mad hat yeah. mad hat trick a bad hat trick it was the imperfect hat trick mm-hmm. um so uh yeah the imperfect hat trick so obviously the perfect hat trick is right foot left foot header so mine was a uh header own goal left foot own goal and the right foot equalizer so yeah not the kind of hat trick that you know, you won't be renowned. I'm sure it's going to be on a pub quiz uh, for a good few years. But yeah, it was it was a good time. You know, um, Chris Wilder when really, he say infancy of of management. Um, you know, was was good. I think he he was good in the fact, that, especially for me, how he treated me as a senior player, let me have my input, but not too much of an input that it overshadowed his. Um, he was, you know, you clearly knew he was the gaffer. Um, he was kind of old school, but he knew the new school way. Um, yeah, so it was it was a good time. So glad to see he's got some success now. Two seasons at Oxford. Coincidentally, you hold the record for Oxford's oldest ever outfield player, which is, is a it? yeah. According wow. to my research, unless I just made that one up, but no, I think I'm right. It's a 37 years. So I think the record still holds to today. I'll have to double check that again. Like, but. Yeah, I mean, it, when I went to, it, in hindsight, it's a good thing I had the, the two years because after my first year, um, I um, had a slip disc in my neck. I don't know if you can see the scar. So I had neck surgery. Um, so, uh, and then that was in the second season. So I, I thought to myself, I'm going to, recover so I can not just for football just so I can walk and and have like you know the whole of my left side lost its strength like muscle loss um I couldn't do a press up couldn't do nothing couldn't like I couldn't even like some of my arms out couldn't even push it out so over time it's lost so I thought I need surgery then I tried the epidural needle tried all that sort of stuff but nothing worked so um yeah, I needed surgery, so I got myself back playing, um, and that was the aim for me. Regardless of anything else, just get myself back playing. Oxford done well for me, the chairman, the club, to get me the best surgeon. Like they, they found because the chairman was the same as the Wigan Warriors, so he found the best neck surgeon that he's used for some of his rugby players to repair it. Um, so yeah, it was good. Is it about this time you announced your decision to retire? Um, I had a little stint at Hendon, which was, um, it wasn't really worth it. It was, again, a clash of mountain. Like I'm clashing with a lot of managers. But, again, went to Hendon. I was with Junior Lewis, who was, uh, I knew him from Wickham. So he come down there, do a bit of training. I was looking for a club after Oxford, like local. So I didn't want to travel. I just wanted to start in local. I could play. Um, but the only one really local to me would be Luton. Um, and they were like, Fix and set. Uh, that sort of leaguey football, um, and nothing else about having to travel far. Um, and it's, so I, was, I thought I'll train at Hendon for a bit. He said, "I might as well can, you can play and sign. The only contract you can just rip it up. It's not like a like football contract. You can play and you can just it doesn't go anywhere." So okay, fair, fair enough. Um, who's the manager? Um, Gary McCann. Um, um, and it just again. We just, I don't know, the way it ended was weird. I said I was not working out. I thought, fair enough, that's your opinion. Um, not a problem. Wish you well. But then he went in the paper and started hammering me, saying, now nah, we've got better than him. Um, I expected more than him. This and that. Like, saying all these players were better than me, like, it was like, there's not even any need to say that. Like, do you know what I mean? Because he said we parted ways and that was a decision. But he started going in on that sort of stuff. I was like, oh my God. So when I tried to phone Junior, I said, like, if you see what your gap is saying, he then started blanking my calls as well. I thought, really, Junior? Um, so, like, you know, sometimes football's funny like that. So, you know, sometimes people talk, I don't even talk to him, and I had like four games for him um, or something like that. Um, so it was one of them things. But um, yeah, and then I just thought, what am I doing? The effort to reward was becoming less. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to retire and just concentrate on my next phase of life and my next career did you have any 
any thoughts about going directly into coaching or management after retirement? Was that something that crossed your mind? No, from when I was at um, St. Johnson, when the like, retirement phase came in my head, um, it was like, you know, I was, I was doing it, I was writing for the, the Scottish Sun, doing a little bit of journalism, um, doing a journalism course, thinking that I might go that route. And then from journalism, going to the media as a, a, a pundit, but because I've done the journalism course, be taken a little bit more serious. Um, then I want to come down thinking, oh, I might get a little bit offers because I wrote for the Scottish Sun, but it didn't, it didn't materialise like that. Um, so coaching was never be my thing. I thought I'd give enough time. I want to spend time with family and coaching just going to be another and do more time on top of that. So it wasn't something I was looking to go into. So I did a little bit of media work. Um, but again, it was a lot of little small bits to, you know, Chelsea TV and other stuff like that to really do a hint. And it wasn't really oh, like, oh my God, love doing this. It didn't hold me that passion. I love doing this. Um, so, you know, that's when someone said I'll do about uh, motivational speaking. Um, so I went and done a little... Uh, keynote speaking, all to a lady, the um, little one-to-one course, like intensive four-day one-to-one course. So qualified in that, and then looking into the, the executive coaching. So I went and done, um, got an advanced diploma in that. Um, so like just to, to the journey is taking me here, and you know I think you find a lot of players they find when they go into transition and where they find themselves. Yeah. It's not yeah, some fall into the the coaching, some fall into the media sort of stuff. But um some find like find themselves a little longer looking for what they do next. You know, you, every time you retire, you're retiring with a batch of players that are retiring. Um so, you know, you're becoming one of many and it's like a scramble to, to see and get what you get. And I always say like there's a there's sort of like a tier of players come post-football. So you have the top elite players that, you know, you might have, you know, the international, the household names that they're knocked doors and they're open very quickly and people will actually open the doors before they ever knock for opportunities and find themselves. And then you have the players that are lower down that start thinking of post-careers far earlier because financially they need to, you know, football now isn't a great breadwinner. So they're thinking about the next bit very soon and they all of a sudden they, they're transitioning very early on and then by the time they get to the real retirement age, 35, they've already established themselves, got themselves a trade and have an earnings. And then you've got the players in between that are successful, very good. So they're not thinking about the the next career. They're thinking, I've got everything in this, this my football, my football, football, football. Or they're always in that stage. They're not bad enough to be thinking, oh, I've got a, think about my next career, they're like, no, I'm better than that. So they're in that. So then when they finish, then they go for this long transition and they're not big enough to knock down the ones that are household names and compete with them. So they have to find themselves. Now they're not really in that point where they, they can't compete with the others because they've already got like six years or five years and transitioned early on. So now you're behind them. So now you find yourself in this middle bit and now you're competing with everyone. So now you've got to find yourself and, you know, coaching, they might have transitioned into coaching earlier. You're not a household name. Now you've got to find someone to get you in the door. You want a coaching course with most of the people in here. Then you've got to go and do your CV. You're finding, you'll always find yourself. So you're in this middle bubble where it's much, you know, the crabs in a barrel, sort of like, and you're trying to get out. But as you're getting out, you're competing with people trying to climb. So it's in that middle section here is, you know, your players find themselves is very hard. And, you know, these may be the ones that suffer with mental illness a lot sooner because they don't know where they are. They can't find themselves. And, they, you know, they're not just getting a job straight away. Or they haven't already thought about a job and they already got a job as soon as they come out of football. Do you know what I mean? And if they do, it's down the bottom with no money. But they've got no money, but they've got much more responsibility because they've got family and house and bills and this and that. So... Is it, yeah, so in that sort of transition stage, it's that. So um, it's very difficult um, for most players. Um, and listen, don't get me wrong, those players, you, you, you earn it, don't you? So I'm not begrudging the players at household names. They've had 
a 20 year career, 15 year career to earn. No one's give them anything. They've had to earn everything they've got and what they've got, they've earned. So if someone's opened the door very soon for them, they've earned that opportunity. Do you know what I mean? But I'm just saying for players is a little tear or where they sit in that makes it sometimes a little bit more difficult for players because all they know is to kick a ball. And with the perception of what a footballer is, not everyone wants to hold your hand up and go, okay, there you go. Here's an opportunity because all they see you is kick a ball. They don't see your qualities. I think you hit the nail on the head there as well. A lot of what you said really resonates because if you've, if you're used to having such a big social status, such big earning capacity, and then you, you go from that to then having to start something new. Like it's a very hard, difficult thing to then yeah. be at the bottom of something or having to restart at an age where you are not as impressionable, you're not as keen to learn new skills or maybe even as keen to socialise with people. It should yeah. be a, it's quite a daunting thing for a 35, 36 year old footballer to have, have to face. You've got, you've got, you know, you've got kids, a missus saying, we need this. Mm. Kids are starting this. September starts, kids need uh-huh. uniform. You're like, okay, bit of pressure. Okay, we're going to start. Do you want to be sitting there and having? Remember, you've all gone. Through, you've gone through the stage where you was the apprentice, the young lad, and then the, to be someone barking orders. You don't want to be thirty-five and having some twenty-six-year-old telling you, you know, you've got to do this, this, whatever the profession is. I mean, not that you're like, oh, too good to be told, but it's like it's a hard thing, and it's it's like you know, you have to be humble, you have to swallow yourself, especially from being this status of being a cult hero, a terrorist hero, or someone like goal scoring here every Saturday to be in a name badge wherever you are or uh, uh, an employee number or an apprentice in whatever you're doing is to be is to be daunting, do you know what I mean? So it, it's it's a it's a the transition is 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 difficult. I suppose it's difficult in a lot of sports, but from a footballer's point of view, it's very difficult when you need to find yourself, especially when you're in that middle bracket and trying to what's going to separate you from the the guy, unless you're a, a 600 game for one club, which not many of them anymore, mm. but you actually get some affiliation with the club, an ambassador role, or you know, go and do, there's not really many like you can affiliate yourself and to go and do that. So it's it's difficult. <clears throat> do you think there should be more jobs in football for footballers when they retire? So, for instance, whether that be on the VAR, on the VAR system, team. Um, to do with the punditry, to do with the refereeing, to do with uh, advising young players through the PFA. Do you feel that there could be a lot more roles for footballers within football? If yeah, was- I, I think, I think, I think they, they, they definitely they can create a lot more roles. Definitely they can create uh, certain things so it's easier for football to transition into um, and not just leave them, especially when they know that the way footballers go off and away and the mental health happens and so many footballers lose themselves. Yeah, I think that there, there, there's roles there, especially within football, to get that footballing mindset and then they can obviously educate and retrain them. There's different roles, like you just said, like being in VAR, having a footballer's point of view in that in that room. Um, you know, help educating um, youngsters. Um, just, just, just being there, mentoring, do you know what I mean? help mentor youngsters, help. There's, there's different ones that uh, they, sh- they should be. That's what the PFA should do. Um, do I think they do a good job? Not at all. I think they do a poor job. I think they do an awful job for players. Um, when players need something for, um, for, for example, a player wants to retrain on a, say like, he wants, I want to do a podcasting course. It costs £800. Goes to the PFA. They tell him to pay that £800 and they reimburse him for half once he's paid. But it's coming to him in the first place because he hasn't got £800. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like, well, how are you going to do it? Like, we need to, here's a course we want to do. Boom. Do you know what I mean? Even they set limits, like, okay, yeah, but you, it's your seventh training course. Do you know what I mean? But when you've paid to a PFA for so many years and this is like your union and help people, <coughs> that's what they should do. Um, make it a lot more easier for players to, if they're not helping them in football, help them to retrain and get them in employment because that would be a great advert for football in general to say, look, and I always say to people, when I go and speak to people, I say a footballer 
has much more skills than a great left foot or put the ball in the top corner. They're resilient. You know, footballers heard more no's and had injuries and setbacks than most people. A footballer can handle change better than most people in the office because that's all they've ever dealt with. Change of employee, change of manager, change of teammate, change, 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 change. It's happened all for your career. And you adapt and you still have to be the best you can be. You know, determined. You have to be because you're that 0.01 to get to where you're at. Do you know what I mean? You're focused. You have to be focused. You have to block out everything. To, so you have more skill set than people give you credit for. In fact, give yourself more credit for. Do you know what I mean? You're just sitting there, I was, I, was, I was a great goal scorer. Yeah, but in that, what did you do? You was a great goal scorer, but to get to being a great goal scorer, you had to outshine 20,000 people to get your spot from the age of nine. So you have this determination in you. So if you, if you start stripping that down, in your mindset, I'm sure if you set yourself to become your own boss at a carpentry shop, you wanted to, you could set yourself to do that. You're determined, it's in you. Your focus is in you, resilient. So someone says no, it doesn't matter because you go and wait to hear a yes. That's how you got to football. So there's a lot more than people or footballers give themselves credit for, let alone people that set Caesar Football Agency, <coughs> this, um, yeah, striker, ah, he's all right. He missed chances. Defender, yeah, he's not bad. He's just tall and stiff and fast. There's a lot more. The difference is when these footballers get to this group, the difference in levels of determination, uh, you know, resilience, you know, is elite. The elite, you can do it consistently and it separates them. But to get to where you get to, you have to have all these qualities that, you know, people don't give you credit for. We've seen campaigns in football for as long as I can remember since I was a kid from kick out racism, to speak out about it, to Black Lives Matter campaign more recently added to the back of Premier League players. I would like to ask you, as a black, as a black player who applied his trade in this country, did you ever experience racism playing football? So, in a competitive sort of environment? No, not, not, no, not, um, I always say I was fortunate that a John Barnes, a Luther Blissett, uh, Paul Canneville, yeah. Laurie Cunningham, uh, you know, they all uh, took that brunt from me so I can play in an environment that was racist free. Um, so I never got that, what they got. You know, I've played in Czech as a back a European game for Chelsea, and I've heard the monkey chants. Do you know what I mean? I've, that's as close as, like, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've got, like, the stamping um racism um but i've never i've never i never got it i mean the, the closest are like racism on the pitch i remember playing for stoke i don't know if it was um mama sadibi or someone a french son and someone said something to be french or black or something, something like that and he reported it and i i said yeah boom was his witness and nothing got done and that's why there's a I'm skeptical about the the campaigns. Like, what to put a t-shirt on? Like, I hope like Black Lives Matter is not just another t-shirt campaign or another thing campaign comes out. You know, we're gonna have it before the the team photo, and it's just yeah, okay. You know, just spoke about yeah, black. You know, it's become a theme. Okay, yeah, we've got to have these uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, it's, I hope it's a little bit more than just you know, kick it out. Of racism out you know because you know that campaign isn't the, the strongest it's just a another thing hold the cards up put the t-shirt on when the warm up and good to go so it's not strong i hope this is much stronger and it's it's time that there was action more than anything not just like you know we're going to do the thing okay is that, okay we'll do the campaigns we've got no it's much stronger but i never sampled it um personally um playing football Fortunately, as I said, like, there's people like the, the Paul Cannavals, John Barnes, Luther Blissett, Seal Regis, they, they took the brunt so I can play, um, you know, with some freedom. And hopefully, this Black Lives Matter is so the next generation can not play football with some freedom, can become chairman and can become director with no obstacles. That's what the next, this is what hopefully this does. So there's an equality that they can become, you know, the chairman of the board sitting there and the chairman's meeting, you know, might be 
you know, a Les Ferdinand um, and Andy Cole might be director of, you know I mean, those sort of faces that have no objections and they, you know, that can be there, that, that can be managed as easily. So that's why um, hopefully there's a little bit more meat on this um, this campaign. It's just not a T-shirt or, you know, on the back of a, a shirt. Yeah, you're not the first player to say this. The first player I've had on the podcast to say these things about more needs to be done rather than, than just promotions or T-shirts. So I think hopefully the guys can really look at it and try to find ways to implement it. I know it's... It's a very difficult subject, and it's a very difficult subject to tackle. How would yeah. how would you deal with it if you was in charge? How, what would you do to improve things? Um, starting from the top, so there needs to be the, the, the thinking is at the moment is the same. The hiring process is the same. So you get all people that are white making decisions. So the the, the thinking is the same. So you need diverse way of thinking. So just like a jury, when, you know, if a jury says like, you know, you've got to have a unanimous decision, get some diversity in there so everyone has to agree because your background, your background, your way of thinking, your way of thinking is going to be different. So now we get like a different way of thinking, improved way, a bit of innovation. So I mean, the hiring process, you know, why? Like, okay, I think he's good for this reason. Okay, he's good for this reason. So we need to start at the top, getting a few... Um, black directors in the black like people in the board that just to change the way of thinking, change the way things are done. So once it starts changing at the top, then it feels down. You know, when it starts thinking, you know, like at the bottom and, you know, I would get we get some just some BAME um, in the interview room. And, yeah, but the people making the decisions are not BAME, so it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? So it needs to be some sort of change from the top. You know, some you know diversity and inclusion. You know, and inclusion doesn't mean just including and you got you're included, but you've got to think the way you think. Your inclusion means bring yourself, bring yourself, and be authentic and show us your way of thinking, not just included and be and just think our way of thinking and be quiet. Inclusion, like you want to hear what your thoughts are. Cause that's why you're on the place. That's why you're here. So, you know, because you're, you're different than us. You're different. Your thinking is different, and that's what you need to add. Do you know what I mean? So it's, if there's going to be change, it starts from the top, you know, and we need more, you know, black board members in, in not just football, in, in lots of, look at lots of the top companies around in the world. They don't have m many top executives. Do you know what I mean? A few uh, directors sprinkled here and there, but that, like the real like decisions and the real, the real top floor but they all sitting around that round table. There's not many black um, executive and exec teams. So that's what needs to be changed. I'd like to come on to a little bit about made leaders, a little bit yep. about the organization, a little bit about what you guys do and what where you're kind of where you're at with it at the moment, where you're pushing forward and what's happening. So made leaders is is for me is Helping people to become better, do better, and inspire to want better. Um, and we, you know, we speak about, you know, leaders are made, not born. I don't think anyone is born, you know, you have a great start, but everything is down to growth, nourishment, building, learning, educating, and that's what we try and do. You know, my, my niche, what separates me is, I use everything I've spoke about today in my experiences, my my life skills, and the mindset that made me successful. So, like I said, that like footballers, we have much more to offer than people talk about. Resilience for a start, such a buzzword in in the you know corporate world. People struggle with it. So, I mean, people try to struggle with change. It's part of my life. The stats saying the amount of different three thousand different teammates or so. Um, you know, change of location change of management change of none of them things phase you. you just have to still be the best you have to be so we've made leaders you know we look to go in and and help by giving them a different mindset i always say to people seven and two is nine but so is five and four 
So I'm coming in with a five and four. You know seven and two is nine, but at some stage, you're going to need a different change of mindset. So if five and four helps you get to nine better than your seven and two, there you go. But you know what? You might stick with your seven and two, but sometimes it's like, okay, I know a different way of dealing with it. Here's someone that's had success in a different world. Let me try and use that blueprint because success leaves blueprints. So whether you're looking at a Steve Jobs in a, the tech world, you're looking at um, a LeBron James in the sporting world, they leave footprints of success and most of them will be the same in how they do it. So I'm saying to you, sometimes you follow the blueprint. Don't worry about the profession or the industry. So when I'm talking to people, is like I'm taking my success blueprint and saying, here, this is what you can do. If you don't want to do it, fine. You sit and stay where you are. But we know that sitting and staying where you are sometimes going book backwards because everyone is always moving forward. If you apply what I'm saying to you, you have a chance of being successful. Do you know what I mean? Here's a chance of being successful. So it's just another way what we do. So I, I go into companies and deliver talks. Um, I go into companies and, and coach one-on-ones. People that be, um, have set themselves goals, like someone who's 22, I want to be a director but I'm 26 and here's the plan is what we can do is how you can apply um, and at the moment um, I'm just going into companies and, and helping them with their you know ways of changing in, like, with a diversity inclusion sort of thing and, and going in with the Black Lives Matter and actually getting them to realise really wow things are different unconscious bias people are not aware of their unconscious bias um, just educating them and trying to get them to reframe themselves so all of a sudden now, those in position of power to make decisions can sit there with no unconscious bias, can say, you know what, I like him, I like him, I like him. Whether he's a kid from Edmonton 18 and he's not from uh, some fancy area um, in Richmond with that education and university. So I mean, so I'm just trying to help people change their mindset and just change the way they think. And that's what ultimately... Um, we do at Made Leaders and you know that's what I buy for is like changing my I call it the premier mindset um, and just getting people to use what they have be the best they can be um, just by being authentic as well Do you see this being on uh, Made Leaders going sort of online as well with the way the world is coming will there be online programs and tutorials available <laughs> Yeah um, I mean a lot of things since the lockdowns online Zoom, uh, coaching, speaking, you know, send people programs and, and then we speak after with the action points of what they've done. So a lot of it would be online because who knows what the new normal will be uh, when this all settles down. Normality might be um, less intimate and more um, uh, online calls. So we just have to be prepared. But yeah, I've been, I've been online for a long time with calls. Sometimes not every meeting is face to face sometimes it's you know because people are busy these people don't have their, their schedules are busy so sometimes it's like uh, a meeting like this but yeah I offer online as well I've always I've always done online um, you know madeleaders.co.uk has always been there but um, it's it's something that's it's not new to me but what has highlighted is the home isolation just brought people okay zoom online it's like it's not new to what I do and what I've done. Makes a lot of sense when you think about it. If your car's playing up, you would take it to a mechanic. If your phone's playing up, you would take it to a phone shop. If you yeah. need public speaking or re retraining your brain to attack and achieve targets, made leaders is perfect. It's the, the kind of thing that it's built for, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's funny that sometimes, I said the thing the other day, uh, people don't reinvest in themselves. People talk about, oh, I'm investing this, I'm going, but people don't take the time to reinvest in themselves. And that's like with education, reading. And if, if you say, well, okay then, if you had to invest in yourself monthly to help you achieve goals, help you set your targets, help you stay on track, like why wouldn't you? And then, you know, at the end of the day, you're only going to benefit. And when you benefit, all the other stuff you wanted to do will be, done at a far greater scale. Do you know what I mean? So I'm just saying to people, why wouldn't you want to invest in yourself? Like, why wouldn't you want to reinvest in yourself and help have someone help you see things through? People are so quick, oh, you know what? I've, I've got a wedding, I want to lose weight, I'm going to go and see a personal trainer. But 
But if you say, you know what, I want to, I don't want to just be the junior in the company. I want to be a senior. This is how I want to do it. And someone help you and be on top of you and make you accountable. It's perfect. You know, sometimes people need to realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's perfect for when someone wants to do that. So it's sometimes it's down to the individual, but sometimes the individual doesn't know what's available. So that's part of the thing as well is letting people know it's available. But you know, sometimes there's like a lot of things. We all go to different car washes. We know that some of them are rubbish, some of them are good. And in the end, people go, oh, I don't know which one to trust. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the problem. The, the market becomes saturated and people are like, oh, it's too confusing. They all must be rubbish and don't know who to trust. Do you know what I think? I, I, I can see made leader weekends. So like whether that be team bonding exercises as well to go inside. Because I think the mental side of it is only one area that yeah. you're on. To combine yeah. the trust, the trust issues with teams, to combine the physical and the well-being into one, I think it'd be a great package, and I can I can see you really doing well with this in the future. I've, I've, I've ideas, obviously, with, uh, with what I'm doing to combine certain different things. Obviously, I have friends that do, you know, you know, I look at Jamie Lawrence, he, like how he trains, and thinking yes. Yes. having having that weekend. Then once you do that, the morning bit, and having this. Having that, I mean, and combining a, a little bit of all, so they're getting a package and getting, you know, and coming away. Do you know what I mean? Like somewhere where they can relax, detox, boom, be part of it, yeah. use their brain. So, um, listen, it's all them sort of things for me is making. Um, it's just now, obviously, what the new normal is, how that'll work and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But yeah, there's lots of things um, for me just to try and get people to understand that, you know, invest in yourself. You know, and thinking and, and like it's not a, a gimmick. It's it's necessity. It's not like an extra. It, it's a necessity. Do you know what I mean, you're always thinking, how can I invest in myself? It's the best thing to invest in. It's mm. yourself. Listening to you speak, my brain was ticking over with loads of ideas. Then I can just see and see the possibilities of what you're doing. It's really exciting. And yeah, I, uh, so I, I, one would be doing a bit more research on the projects. Yeah, no, I've, I've I've loads of ideas myself, and you know, sometimes like okay. Sometimes you don't want to get too many ideas and be focused on what you're doing and yeah. listen to that. So, but yeah, it's it's um, there's there's a lot there's a lot to to work on. So no aspirations, no aspirations to return to football in in a, any capacity at the moment. No, I listen. I I um I love my football career. And I look back in fondness. I look back proud. Um, I'm a winner. Look at my career. I played with some great players. I played at 500 games, 20 year career. Uh, winners medals personal accolades there's no need to let that rest that now now my thing is let me be successful at this let me sit here and we have this podcast where you know you're the number one podcast in the world I'm the number one um, keynote speaker and executive coach in the world and you know the numbers are through the roof and we're sitting here like you know how a, a Gary V will have you know uh, Eric Thomas on we're sitting there combining and the journeys our journeys are similar in the fact of the growth what you apply to yours we apply to mine that's how I see it so my thing is to be successful in this um, so I can say great great proud of that now now it's about this and applying the same like not looking back I use it I use football as um, uh as my material and what and how it's built got me to this point now. But as far as this project, it needs more than just the football. Yes, it might help me knock on the doors and get the attention, but it's not enough to hold people. There's got to be a little bit more. Okay, so you played football. Now what? Do you know what I mean? So now how I do it and how I deliver has to be a little bit more. So this is how I have to make this great. And so football is, is good and I, I'm always going to be affiliated with football and I love my football and I watch it. Not as intently as I used to, um, but um, my eyes on football, but no intention of going back or being in some capacity. It's crazy when you watch football, you have no idea of how intelligent a footballer is, how deep they are, what their motives are after the game. So to, yeah. to get this time with you today and sit down, it's very interesting. And I'm sure a lot of your fans and fans of the teams you've played for will find it very interesting. I've got to say, I've really, really enjoyed it. I hope, I hope so. I hope so. I hope they do because I mean, yeah, and you don't know. Listen, people's 
people's pitch image will make you turn off a player. Because you see he's on a pitch, he might be aggressive, always snarling, you're thinking, I don't like him. And you see him on the TV, like, oh, I saw him on the other day, it was quite funny. He actually, he's actually down to earth. So you never get, and that's why I believe that, you know, I love watching the NFL and you've got NFL films. Uh, and they, they, you get to hear the players and the touch dynasty. And I think that the, the Premier League, when they started, should have had that sort of contract where you get in to see the players because Premier League is so far removed from the fans. Yeah. You don't get to see them. You know, you don't get to be near them. Training games are off, off limits. If you had something where you see the personalities and you see, like, Harry Kane was the funniest person in the dressing room, you yeah. saw Raheem Sterling like was scared of spiders and you saw a little bit of their personality, it yeah. make you even more into them. So, but where it's so, you know, only when players talk and they're, they're so guarded because everyone's trying to stitch them up, interview. So they get, all that happens is they get guarded. Okay, yeah. We're going, okay, yeah. So yeah, and they just got to talk when they talk. Their personality don't come out. Only when you see little bits and pieces, you see like how a, a John Stones is the funny one, always singing up. But everyone would love that because it might make them warm to him as a player thinking, like Kay's made a mistake. This guy makes me laugh. I like him. Why they just see the player? I look at him, sound so million pound, making mistakes. Look at him. Oh yeah, look. They don't see the other side. So if you saw something that might make you warm to someone, whether he's on your team or not, you know, it's 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 something that, that people would see. They might see like, oh, like he's uh he's always joking. He's always why, why is he so aggressive? I can see why he wants to be. The, there's there's something they they can see. But at the moment, you just see pitch image. You just see that. Um, you know, like for me. You see, like a Troy Deeney, like who's vocal and he says these stuff. You're thinking, God, we like we'd like to know more of him and yeah. see more. Obviously, I see bits and pieces on other people's social media of him, but like some like that people hear and speak, like oh my God, like whether you're a Watford fan, Man United fan, do you know what I mean, then when he does his post-match interviews, it makes sense why he's saying, like oh, they need to, like yeah, I don't care, they're Arsenal, like this is us. You think yeah, it makes sense. That's who he is. Rather than just, oh, look at him, like, oh, who's he to speak about Arsenal when he's at Watford? Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no, you don't get to see the personality. So that's something they should have done um, at the, the, the infancy stage of the Premier League and say, we have access, we let the fans see. I don't think we can see the Premier League ground how it went. But at the moment, you just don't get to see anything other than the, the interview stage of players and they become so guarded because they think, if they say something wrong, yeah, the manager said, and they, oh, they trip him up, he's used this way, and then they make a big deal. So, no one, I think maybe people are scared of seeing something they shouldn't see. It's brand now, and it's like you make a mistake, you're messing up the Etihad brand, or you're messing up the city brand. So, like, yeah, so it'd be nice to see a little bit more. Like you say, I think players live in fear. Current players, yeah. in particular, are obviously given a certain brief by the club what they can mention, tweet, interact with, and respond with. And I think that that kind of governs it. Where players that have retired, they're a bit more sort of able to share their opinions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that. I, I still think if there if there's like like behind the scenes cameras and the cameras, not necessarily tweeting. You know, the, 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 the cameras in the training ground have gone in there on the sideline and talking. You know, the NFL is just as big as the Premier League. That like, it's, it's always been a case that like talking, they might tap the this and that. You know, there might be a few beep, beep, beep. And it's part of it. It's just, it's just more entertaining. You're seeing a different side. You're seeing, you know, someone might be pressured. Like, we're worried about image. You know, just you're seeing, just to see the personalities of players. So, like, a bit more. And they're not necessarily, they're, they're tweeting. They're just, they're just being themselves. You know, they're not saying anything different. You know, they're aware of the cameras. They're not going to say anything like we're going to get someone in trouble, in trouble. Um, you know, and if it's used in that sense, it'd be cut. But it's just part of, the Premier League TV brand and that like, it shows it'd be great footage, be great, you know, you know, what the, the, the programs when you've seen like the, the Man City or, you know, behind the scenes one, um, Hard Knocks, all them sort of things where... Sunderland one as well. Fantastic. Yeah, all them things, like people love them. Do you know what I mean? Like following it there and you're seeing, like, you're seeing Pep and how he approaches his player, like, oh my God, like, love that. He's talking, he's passionate. He's like thinking, yeah, you're actually in the change room, you're seeing that. Mm. That's, that's that's valuable so it should be a little bit more yeah I, I, I could not agree more with you what you said again I completely agree with like at the moment with the fans not being in the ground you're hearing a little bit more if you've got mm. the ability to turn off the fake crowd sounds yeah. which I haven't I mean yeah. 
it, it would be fantastic, like you say, to hear the stuff in the dressing room, to hear them having a bit of banter before the games. It, it would humanise football a lot more. Yeah, I, I think so. Even, even if you've got a mic and they're coaching and they're saying, like, you know, they're, they're breaking down the left, we'll put him on, like, even that little bit of moment of panic and, like, you know, they go and think, like, boom, boom, boom. It's like, well, that's what happens. Do you know what I mean? Or there might be a time when they're calm. Like, I just think that everyone's scared of being the, the Graham Taylor, or like, you know, what happened in the World Cup thing. I think they're all scared of that. But, like, it happens. Like, that, that was him and that was the time he panicked. He's, he's in the World Cup qualifier. He's panicking. So, I think everyone wants their image. And, unfortunately, that's what we're going to get. But it, it, it just makes it a little bit like, you know, I think, I think it would benefit players if their personalities on on show at times rightly or wrongly the Premier League has sort of continued many people had their thoughts on it did you think it was right for the Premier League football to return do you think it was wrong for Premier League football to return in your opinion Dubs um, I, I don't I, I don't think we're out of what we're out of um, I don't think it's right um, I think you're jeopardising um, families when you're mixing and mingling are you doing tests but like we have a, a duty as you know I'm a dad I don't want to go back to a young family um, just for football wise um, I don't think you should have continued um, you know if you're living in a bubble and you're saying okay we're going to finish the season and we're going to do eight weeks when no one's allowed home might be a bit harsh on a family but it's the way we're going to do it um, but either way um, it just seems like, like most things now everything's open it's, it's not health wise it's just like economy wise and money wise it's driven by that um, it should be people's safety it should be driven by saying you know what this is bigger than football like you know this is people saying it's the biggest thing to disrupt uh, like the world since World War 2 but yet we're carrying on it's just like when everyone was talking about like mad cow disease I'll carry on as normal this is this is far greater um we don't even know what we're dealing with that, the, the stuff coming out. So it should be health first. Let's get through this. There'll be we get through this. There'll be plenty more seasons. Be the, the the year that football got halted by COVID nineteen, and then we, we move on. Do you know what I mean? And in the meantime, at the break, they should be thinking about other stuff. Like what do we do about players out of contract? How do we do this? Do we do, not like let's just get the games over and done with, and let's get a, you know. Yeah, you know, you, you, you get to that stage because you're going to play in front of stadiums, in front of like packed stadiums. And, like, you know, you don't want to then go home and not be able to hug your children, you do a test and, oh, you're free. But if you're not, you know, there's a, there's a, they call it a, asystematic people that don't show signs but still carrying it and then pass it on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Talk about that. Like, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's all sorts of stuff. So, you know, and did they give players a choice? And if you, you chose not to do it, then you're going to be on the back foot because. You're not playing for your team, so that puts people that and that I don't want to like put himself at risk on the back foot. Like you're not you're not committed. Why don't the other divisions? Why has it just got to be the top division in the Premier League? If it's a case for being best for football, why is it not safe for the other divisions to return? I know the playoff games are going to be going ahead, but yeah. it was by by any stretch of the imagination a lot of football to be played and. A lot of these teams that have got relegated, some of them would have had eight or nine games to get themselves out of this situation. Yeah. They've gone down on predicted points. So why is it okay for the Premier League to resume? When I, think, I, think it's money. I think it's money, sponsors, money. Um, I think it's money. And then if it is money, tell them clubs to fill some of that money down to other teams that struggle. Yeah. You know what I mean? it's, it's just crazy. Like, all this money, is like, like, they're cool. Like, they're not going like, to mess up. Fill some down. Do you know what I mean? Like, if it's if above board, we're going to, you know, a charitable donation to Sun so that ain't no one getting in trouble, filter some down. Like, pick a club. Everyone pick a club and filter some down so they, they don't struggle. Like, I mean, what's the point in just having Premier League teams when there's like, you know, when players don't leave that team, they're unemployed. Young players can't get things. So, if it's just a financial thing, then let, let like, the, the other teams play. So, but it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I just think health and safety wise, not a good idea. Health over wealth. That's what I've always yeah, Always, always. It's, it's, I mean, some people might think, oh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, but it's easy to say you're not playing. Not at all. If I was playing, like, like to put my... If they said, if they said, okay, we're going to have... It's going to be eight weeks. You should do eight weeks away. Um, we're going to be... This situation, train here. 
no contact with son, so just get the season over and done with. Then you might think, okay, it's a long, long way, but I want to be away from my family. Not unless we get a majority vote, it doesn't happen. But not like there and then back home and then let's say there's there's been cases where someone don't show symptoms and they're still carrying. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 not good. I've got to say, I've really enjoyed chatting with you and spending time with you today. I can't uh, thank you enough for making the Zoom, facilitating the Zoom conversation and stuff. Because, like everyone, I, I'm trying to adapt to the world and the situation, and and I appreciate you making that that little bit easier for making yourself available to do this, man. It means a lot. Okay, no, it was good, man. It was good. I enjoyed it. Didn't really like realize that uh, Mrs. Muff again. What's he doing in there? Um, <laughs> yeah. Realize the time. Good man, wicked. I look forward to seeing yeah. uh, it go out anyway. And listen, we'll do a couple more anyway. Yeah, I love it. Little, yeah, we'll definitely do something again. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I've got many, many topics. I can keep you talking for weeks on end. You'll be sick of the sound of my voice by the end of yeah, it. Is, and, uh, any ideas and things like, do you know what I mean? If you get a multiple thing or, or yeah. just a one idea you have, you have an idea, I'll throw at you and say, what do you reckon? You know, and then obviously you can facilitate it. Um, and do it that way. So if I have ideas, we can, we can, you know, we can do it that way. So love that. It's, uh, we just throw it that way. I love see what we can. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I'm going to be in contact uh, again with you soon. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for sharing your time and your story, man. No worries, brother. Stay blessed. Wicked. Thanks, dude. God bless.